All right, we have uh, one more conversation that's going to happen. Um, I would like to kind of shout out the, the conversation that's about to happen or set it up rather in this way. Um, if you are a content creator, this conversation is for you. If you care about Caribbean culture, this conversation is for you. If you are someone that believes that Caribbean culture influences so much more than what meets the eye, this conversation is for you. We have a series of phenomenal people, content creators, that are going to come up here and have a conversation with another YouTube professional. This YouTube professional happens to be one of my favorite. Um, Y'all know, it's like Beauty and the Beast. You see how pretty Amanda and, and Rachel are? I'm the beast though, okay? So I'm the worst thing you'll be looking at today. Next up, we have coming to this stage, a Miss Rachel Jackson. Rachie hailing from Atlanta, the queen, Rachel Jackson. Adam, thank you so much, Adam. I appreciate you, partner them. Hi, everyone. What's going on? Y'all good? Okay, I'm so happy to be home. I see so many smiling faces that I recognize. And for those that I don't know, I'm Rachel Jackson, Artist Partnerships Manager at YouTube and YouTube Music. Say hi, Rachie. Hi, yeah, everybody that's close to me calls me Rachie. So if you just call me Rachie, you my cousin, okay? We close. We're going to be closer and close after the end of this conference. And again, as I stated, I am an artist partnerships manager at YouTube and YouTube Music. And what that means is that I have the unique opportunity to work with artists and their managers to create the best case scenario in terms of visibility for their music and content. And I'm going to be joined by some amazing content creators that do very, very well and have shown winning behavior on YouTube. How many content creators do we have out here in the crowd? How many? Or aspiring content creators? Yes, yes, yes. Raise your hand if you, if content drains you. Be, be real. We being honest. Does content drain you? When you think about content, it just kind of gets on your nerves. Like, I just don't know what to post, or am I posting too little? Am I posting too much? It's cool, because we all started there. I'm not a content creator, but I mean, I have a phone. I post on Instagram, so that makes me a content creator, because I create content, right? Exactly. So I'm going to have the panel come on up. So let the panel come on up. I like this music. Now for a little longer. Yeah, yeah. Don't tip me now. I said I'm at home. I'm going to get real comfortable. Bust a wine on y'all. Give them a hand as they come. A little commotion for the panel. All right. So I love conversations like this. And this conversation that we're about to have is really the epitome of why we do programs such as Future Insiders. We want to connect you to what's winning, who's winning. We want you to get the information that's going to not only inspire you, but then give you actionable steps to get exactly where you want to go. So again, the panel Okay, they're working, they're out here, they have gained visibility for themselves, and again, they display winning behavior, not only on YouTube, but also on social media and in the world, okay? From the Caribbean to the world. All right, let's get it, okay. So, hey y'all, y'all good? Hey. Y'all look Hello. nice, y'all like the fits? Did y'all get into the outfits? Exactly, Bye, exactly. Too. Yeah, you okay, too, right. you too. That's, that's making so we can tell who the comedian is. He got jokes. <laughs> well, don't think you're funny because I'm going to get hilarious, all right? Best behavior. Uh, I'm just playing. Okay, so storytelling is very, very key when it comes down to not only branding yourself but establishing your digital footprint and creating an allegiance between you and your audience. So I'm going to start with you, Naro. Tell us who you are. Again, storytelling is very, very important. And because y'all are at the top of your game, I want you all to just let us know who you are. And then we're going to come back around and we'll do a little exercise. It's going to be fun, though. Okay, so I'm Nara from The Fix, a little known podcast. Shout out to you. All right. Just... All right, she's my co-host. I love... Hey, co-host. That cheering is not legit, by the way. Yeah. See, see. Playing. <laughs> um, yeah, I went to Woolmer's Boys School. Then to UTech, learned most of the trade there. I was the, the first 
a part of the first cohort to study communication arts and technology. Much there, I, I slept a lot in classes, to be honest. And that's all honesty. We love an yeah. honest king. Yeah, um, but I got a lot of my base there, you know, I'm following that pretty much self-taught in this, you know, communication media world, you know, but apart from that, I got a start in journalism. That's what my major was in. Uh, did, was an intern at the Gleaner, where I did sports writing as well. Um, had my own sports show on Sun City Radio, Extra Time and Narrow. So yeah, um, I was brought on to do the fix by my lovely co-host who did the majority of the cheering over there, uh, Miss Ariane Howan. It was her brainchild, you know. She was an intern at Newstart 93FM. Um, she knew me from prep school and high school. And yeah, knew what my major was in and decided to bring me on and say, hey, now you have this show idea. You want to be a part of it? I'm like, okay, cool. I'm fresh out of college, don't have any jobs, so why not? Yeah, so from there on, we got our start on New Start 93 FM at the graveyard shift. We were expected to die, 9 to 11 p.m., Thursday nights. And um, from there, it just sp sprawled off into this adventure where, you know, we're posting clips and interviews on YouTube and before you know it, people approach us in the streets. Hey, me an artist, so I can get on the show. And you know, all those things. So, yeah, it's been a ride so far. That's pretty much origin story of how I do what I do. Thank you for sharing that. Because yeah. people that don't know you, they know you now. You definitely gave us some history. Chinese. Hello, hello everyone. Hello, hello, hello. All right, so of course you guys know, my name is China K, or China K Pop Girl, as you know. And you guys know that I have a business, Jolie Fair Hair. I'm also a media personality, radio personality, and I wear, you know, many hats. Um, so to say I started out, well, I grew up most of my life in New Jersey, and I went to William Patterson University and also California State Uni University in uh, Northridge, and my major was um, my major was media production. So my, my bachelor's is media production with a minor in film studies. Now, when I first started, I was doing business classes, like music business classes. I did not know, I low-key felt like I wasted a little bit of time because I didn't realize that I could go to school for something that I loved. So up and talking to administrators, they were like, yeah, you could do like, you know, things in film and music and also, you know, production. I was like, say word. I could do that in college, and so then I switched, and then I focused on the media production side, which is, you know, what led me also to California. And after that, it was in a sense where, you know, everybody's talking about networking and the importance of, um, you know, meeting people, but I was doing everything that they told us to do by the book in college, and I just kept going on interviews, and it just kept saying no. Or, you know, when you send out your resumes, when they respond back to you, you're excited to see that they respond. And at the first line, it's like, you know, thank you so much for applying. We really love what you, we saw. You are an amazing person. And you put the full stop and the comma. However, but, but unfortunately, you know, a little bit down in the paragraph, you get to those kind of words. And it was very discouraging. So at one point, I was low-key kind of broke, but I really broke, broke. So I asked my sister to take out a card at Best Buy so I could buy a camera. And I bought a Canon 60D. And I could shoot, I could edit, I could host. I was pretty much doing everything myself. I knew how to do it, I knew exactly what I wanted. And there was YouTube. So I went out and I you know, interviewed people and I did everything. I would say, you know, just hold the camera for me, just hold it like this, random strangers, hold the camera like this. And then they would and then I would talk and then I knew exactly what I was shooting and how I was gonna edit it and I did that and I posted content on the YouTube platform and also Facebook as well and it got to a point where a lot of people were, you know, reposting the content, liking the content and everything. And it just got to a point where eventually I got paid to do what I do and open so many doors to, you know, where I am now. Now given the opportunity to do radio, to, you know, host my own show and all that. So from then till now, it has been a progress, you know, on my journey doing that. So radio personality, media personality, host, I can edit, videographer, editor, you name it. Anything in the media field? 
I got it. I know that's right. She said she got it, and I believe her. I believe her. I believe her. Hey, Becca. Hello. Tell us. Hi. Tell us. Hi, everybody. My imposter syndrome is screaming right now. Gosh. No such thing. No such um, thing. No, great to be here. My name is Becca. I am from the UK. I live in London. I, am, I do a lot of different things. Um, I have my fingers in a lot of different <laughs> pies, as they say. So I'm a, a TV presenter in the UK. I've been with MTV for almost 12 years now. Um, I'm ex-Apple Music. I was with them for eight years from when it started. Apple Music won the radio station. Um, I work with lots of different brands, and I'm also a DJ, so I play reggae and dancehall. Uh, I've played festivals from Glastonbury to City Splash, um, supporting people like uh, Protégé, Morgan Heritage, David Rodigan. Um, but I guess the reason why I'm here today is because I created my own platform called Deadly, which spotlights Jamaican music in all its forms. So we do live sessions, interviews, documentaries with some of the sickest artists on the island, basically. We've shot nearly, I would say, a, nearly 100, I think. I need to recount because we just did 15 on this trip. <laughs> we just finished. But yeah, we did some sick, some sick artists from Chronic Law to Valiant to TJ to up-and-coming artists like um, Tori Latour, Indy Allen, uh, medicine sick as well so yeah we covered a lot of ground and that's all the things that I do um, the question also was how did how did we get there right sure share it <laughs> share it um, I guess well deadly started because I saw a, a gap in the market for like more video content around Jamaican culture um, and I was finding that like I was doing a lot of different things and interviews with different artists, but for different platforms rather than my own thing. And somebody gave me some really good advice and said, rather than you pitching to brands and stations and channels saying, oh, can I do this for you? It's like, do your own thing, start your own thing. And then people will want to get involved in that. So yeah, I brainstormed uh, a lot of ideas and I came up with the name Deadly and yeah, started interviewing Jamaican artists when they came to the UK. And now, every year we come here and, yeah, shoot with as many artists as we can fit in, <laughs> basically. Thank you for developing that. That's very key, that you saw a gap, you saw a need, and you utilized content to continue to take Jamaica to the world. So on behalf of Jamaica, if I can, I'm going to thank her for y'all, okay? Thank come you. Come on, well, Becca. Yes. I mean, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm the first to do it. Obviously, like, Shawnee B and One Extra, they've been, like, coming to Jamaica and spotlighting, like, the, the music and the culture for time. So, like, yeah. But we just need more. So that's, that's Right, and I it starts with add. you. So we need more. Becca says she needs more. So some of y'all might want to tap in with her at some point so you can figure out how to start your own. Alicia. Hey. Hey. Tell oh. us who you are and how you got to be you. So I am Alicia Powell. We started a YouTube channel called The Powells back in, I believe two years ago or three years ago. I cannot keep track. I have mom brain and I'm forgetful. So excuse that. And we have a podcast as well called Fast Lane Lifestyle. But how we kind of jumped into the YouTube world accidentally, we didn't really know, we have no background in that, but I come from the fashion world as well. I used to live in New York, but we came into it, I was pregnant, I was tired, my husband kept posting me, people were like laughing because I was pregnant and tired and I just wanted to get that baby out, like let me get my body back. So um, everyone was like, you know, start a channel, but we never knew the magnitude and the effect that we would have on YouTube and also learning as we go as well. So as I was listening to the both of you guys talk, I'm like, wow, I need to speak to them and learn from them. But um, now we're also on social media as well and dibbling and dabbling, but we're loving being here and creating and having an impact, showcasing my family. I'm a mom, I'm a wife, um, mom of two boys, they keep me busy. And content creating, let me tell you, it's hard. It's very difficult, and I'm learning that now as we go. So hats off, like it's really not an easy job. You see a 30 second video, and you're like, oh, that looks easy, I can do that. No, it's very hard. It might take like 24 hours or a week just for you to see that, right? Um, so 
That's a little bit about me also. I'm Ghanaian. I was born in Ghana, moved to Toronto when I was about 10, and now I'm living here. So learning and adapting and growing and being open and learning with you guys publicly as well. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much for sharing so transparently. And my favorite word in everything that you said is we. Okay, look, when I get married Shout and I have a husband, husband, I'm a my husband, my husband, my husband. We, we, we all to death. Y'all are going to be sick. We're one. Me. French. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we as a French word. See, I, I thought we agreed on best behavior. <laughs> you like one more time. It's got my principal necktie on. Don't play with me. Okay. But the thing that sticks out to me the most that you all have in common is that through your stories that you just told us all, you all took adjacent roles. It wasn't just let me pick up my phone and let me present one way. You did a lot of different things that landed you there. And you know, this, the saying goes that Jamaicans have more than one job. Y'all know that, right? If you got more than one job, make some noise in life. Exactly. Okay? So I want you to talk to us all about how you decided to narrow down what you do and make it relate to the content that you create and how you show up. How did you bring it all together and say, okay, I'm starting with 10 things, here are my five things, these things relate, and this is how I'm going to take my next step through my career? Well, for me, basically, it was a lot of trial and error. You know, and working with people who are like-minded, people who you rock with naturally, you know, friends, you know, because not only, uh, I knew Ari from, who's another co-host of mine, so, you know, through, us being a, a group of close-knit friends, you know, doing something that we're not sure about and, you know, a lot of trial and error, that's how you basically get to navigate your way through the space, you know, because, you know, as Alicia said, this is not easy. It's not easy at all. And we, we quickly found that out because our thing came from, you know, acknowledging or, or really pointing out that, you know, why isn't, why aren't radio stations really posting, you know, their content on YouTube, you know, on digital? Like a lot of that wasn't really being done 10 years ago when we started. And it came from a need that we recognize and say, hey, we could fill this gap, but, you know, things are easier said than done. You know, so, yes, yeah, so it's true a lot of trial and error, but through that, you live, you learn, you know, sometimes you take your losses, sometime in public, you know, and you, you just take it with a, a grain of salt and you just, you know, continue to just move on. Because one thing in this life, you, know, you have to keep moving. If you stay stagnant, you're dead in high water, so you have to just keep moving. Right, right. And Becca, you are a business owner on top of also being an on-camera personality, content creator, host there are so many things the list goes on so talk to us about how you do your day how do you schedule your day out to where you can show up as you in full effect in so many different ways at one time adhd <laughs> i know that's right it's the pretty half the room have adhd i imagine yeah i mean sometimes it's a mess i'm not gonna lie sometimes it's not um the best way to do it is to schedule on a Sunday exactly how each day is going to look. And I find if I don't do that, I'm often a bit all over the place. Because every single week, as, I, as I'm sure it is with you guys and most people here, it's like every week is very different for a creative and never looks the same. So balancing it, I, I do get overwhelmed. But I try and make sure that I have like my strict morning routine that I stick to. Um, which involves like meditating before I've turned on my phone, you know, little things like that, that really uh, get my head straight. And yeah, it's all about just planning out how you how you spend your time. Um, and if, if I don't do that, then my ADHD gets the better of me and nothing really gets done. And then I get stressed and annoyed with myself and impending doom for the rest of the day <laughs> slash week. So yeah, it's something that I am constantly trying to navigate, trying to balance all the different things um, and working out how to prioritize. What, what is the priority here? 
Is it the DJ set that I have on Friday? Is it the presenting job that I need to prep for tomorrow? Is it the deadly content that's going out on Sunday? It's, that's a constant uh, battle. <laughs> Not a battle, but like it's something to, to navigate for sure. So, so long as I've got my strict routine in the morning and I try and make sure that I'm getting the right amount of sleep and I'm scheduling some time off, uh, which I don't do that very often, but um, yeah, I have to, you have to have that, that foundation to then create the space in your head to be able to plan out the days. <laughs> yes, routine is very important. And in my opinion, being a content creator is more of a journey where you're constantly learning, you're constantly changing. You're not only reading analytics and making changes to your content, but you're also reading yourself and figuring out how you need to move based on how you decide to represent every single day. And Chani, when you were giving your story, it seemed like you had a lot of different jobs. So I wanna go back to you and talk about adjacent roles and talk about what actually supported where you are. How did you get to where you are with the support of the experiences that you had along the way? All right, so, um, you know, when you live in America, you have to get a job from like, you could get a job legally, right? So I was working at an ice cream shop at 15, straight up until I graduated college. It was a small family business and there was, I was the only black person working there, but I loved like every single thing about it. However, while I was doing that, I was thinking of other ways that I could be independent and I could be money and show, have money and show off you know, everything that I was capable of doing. So that's when I started Jolie Fair, which is, I started selling hair, uh, hair extensions. And when I tell you the people that robbed me, they robbed me left and right using fake credit cards and everything. So it was very discouraging at the time, you know, using my ice cream paycheck to try to start my own business. And it was very discouraging that people would, you know, scam me. So then I took a step back but never stopped, you understand? So while I was doing that, going to college, I also worked at a radio station for free, was 45 minutes away and I would wake up at six and do the radio and you know come back and work and do all that. So when I was explaining earlier that I started a series called the On My Mind series, I, like now content creation is so different when I hear everybody talking about schedule and analytics and this. Back then when, I'm, I mean I'm young and jiving, don't get me twisted, but like when I first started, it was never that for me. I just loved creating content. I still do love creating content. I love the excitement of hosting, the excitement of the feedback I get from people watching my content. And I loved sitting there for hours editing. Even though you were saying 30 second video takes a while, Oh, I loved sitting there and editing. Like, it's just the love of it. And I was not making any money. When my sister got me that camera and I was doing all that I'm telling you, I'm starting my show in India, I'm in Cuba, I'm in Jamaica, I'm all over the US, I was not making any money. And it wasn't until, um, my content was so good, other blogs and blogs kept reposting it, it's in a paper and everything, and Scan Media, they wanted me to host an event. And they were like, we're gonna pay you $800. And my eyes lit up because I was like, I could get paid for doing this? I was just doing it for the fun of it. And I said, say word, 800, they flew me to Jamaica and I shot everything they had to shot, edit it, and they gave, they gave me my money on time. And ever since then, I was like, okay, I can make money. So it went from that to making money on YouTube. Then now um, I did a reality show called The Social House that was in Jamaica and I can't see you wrong. So when I did it, a lot of people in Jamaica didn't know me. They only knew me, like diaspora knew me from the US because that's where I grew up. So when I did the social house, everybody's like, why should talk like that? Why should I twang? Where should come from? This and that, they didn't know me. However, I meds it differently. You watching me on the social house, you get to know who Chani K is, know what I'm about, and I get to promote my business. You understand what I'm saying? So when you see me, you know my business. So that's how I leverage it. And would you believe I won? Mm -hmm. I won on top of that. I, I believe it. Yeah, girl. I believe. Make so some noise <laughs> if you believe it. I told Thanks, you in shiny we trust. <laughs> Thanks. So I won, and ever since I won, I didn't think I was gonna win going into it, but when I did, it definitely pushed me a lot in Jamaica. I ended up being the top social media influencer of the year, woman to watch, um, so many different things, you know, being on the, uh, the news and the papers in the States and everything, and then to eventually having 
a show on the radio. I was approached to have my show on the radios, which I'm on now, uh, Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. on 5105. You guys could check it out, <laughs> right? So, and I still do everything that I love. And the content creation, I just post, just, I'm just me. And people relate to me. And because of that, I now have a following and you know, work with a lot of brands and stuff. So for me, it's just, I'm just myself. And people like that. And people support my, my product because they like me. You understand? So it's just so many little different things that I've done. I mean, like, notice, but I'm going to tell you. Like, it was so hard for me at one point. I would come to Jamaica. I'm having, you know, being popular. You know, I'm shooting my On My Mind series and all that. But when I went back to Jersey, I was broke. I was broke. I was working at Bath and Body Works, and it was a seasonal job. But you know when you, when you start a new job, you don't really get that pay right away. It takes time. I was low-key like eating co-workers lunch from the freezer. I was only feeding on $2 chicken pot pies from Walmart. It was so good. But after a while of eating chicken pot pies, I don't even, to this day, I don't want to see another chicken pot pie. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? But I did it for the love of it. And now I'm to the point where I'm achieving so many different things that I never thought in a million years that I would achieve just because I'm me. And just because I just followed doing everything that I loved first. Do it for the love. The money and them something that, that'll come after. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Bars. Thank you so much. Alicia, you make motherhood and familyhood just look so good. Okay? Really? Yes, you do. And as a mother, I'm sure I'm not a mother, but I have one. And we know, just in general, if you have a relationship with any woman, it's not glam all the time. There are a lot of things going on, and I'm sure that you probably just want to throw in the towel half the time. So talk to us about what drives you, and also give us a little sprinkle, sprinkle on your magic. How do you continually show up authentically and just make it look so good? Well, that's a big compliment because sometimes I'm struggling, but I guess we don't look like what we're going through, and that's a blessing. Um, I just wake up every day, I start my day, pray, and then anything you see on our vlogs is really who I am, who my family is, how we operate. Um, being a mom, obviously being a woman, naturally you're gonna wear many hats. So I think it's in our nature and we adapt, we adjust. So no matter how hard things get, obviously as marriage isn't easy, we try to, my husband and I, some people in here might hate me for this, but we come first. So that's how we keep. We. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that I don't love my kids, you know that. It just means that I want them to see what a healthy marriage looks like. I want to be able to know my husband when they're gone off to college, right? I'm not just sitting there being like, who are you? What do I talk to you about, right? So on social media, that's what I want people to see. So I'm always being authentic. I'm always being myself, as you say. My kids, I try to put them on there, but still you need to have some privacy, like their schools, our community, try to keep them safe. But with him and I, I just think we just wanna be positive role models that marriage, you always hear these jokes like, oh, you're going home to your wife? Like, it's not like that. You can have fun, date each other. And I think that would be like my motivation is, I want my kids to say, damn, my mom, she was a boss wife, she's a boss lady, you know, and still have your own identity outside of all of that. Don't lose yourself in the sauce. That's really, that's really it. So I can look at myself in the mirror and be like, I recognize who I am. I'm still mom, I'm still wife, but I'm still Alicia before all of this because that's what completes everything. So that would be the advice, yes. I love that, thank you so much. I'm gonna pull from something that you mentioned, privacy. When we think of content creation, often we think about, okay, I gotta expose this, I gotta show that. How do you create a feeling of belonging with your audiences? And Becca, I'm gonna start with you, Chani, and then Naro, chime in, please. How do you create a genuine connection and share transparently and share authentically, but then still have time for yourself where it's just, you and you, and have that private moment while you have to be so transparent all the time? Mm, good question. I, yeah, I'm an oversharer. <laughs> I'm that person where if somebody says in small talk, hey, how you doing? I'm like, 
oh my God, I nearly had a panic attack this morning because this person said this to me. You know what I mean? I just say too much all the time and I um, and regret it mostly. <laughs> so that's something I'm navigating right now. What, what are my boundaries? What do I want to that's share? Real. That's real. I think it's important to, if you're feeling this too, sit down and like work it out, write out exactly what it is that you're willing to do and say and share. Um, because I did not do that, um, but that's what I'm like working out right now. And I think there's a there's a really fine line between connecting with the audience and just having no privacy whatsoever. So yeah, it's a tricky one because I'm talking on behalf of like I am running two accounts essentially. There's Becca Dudley, DJ, and like presenter and like I guess creator of Deadly but then there's the Deadly account and so the way that I engage on the Deadly account is very different to my page so from the Deadly account there's no sort of personal you know oversharing I make sure that my um, social media guy was briefed on exactly what the tone of the page was so that we're always engaging with the people that are commenting and messaging in the same voice you know that that is authentic to the brand. And so I think that's a really good way of connecting with your audience as well, is like finding out, okay, what is our tone of voice? Is it your chatty best mate? Is it like cool hype beast kind of energy where you kind of say the least, you're not sending like a million heart emojis, you know? It's like finding that voice, sticking with it, and then that being a part of the brand. Um, and I think, yeah, that's a good way to stay authentic and keep interacting with your audience in that way, if that makes sense. No, it makes sense, yeah, indeed. Yeah. Definitely makes sense. Not if it made sense. Becca's up here making some sense, exactly. Chinese, how do you establish boundaries in your content while you're sharing? So for me, I keep a lot private, okay? I started um, a series called, well, it's not a series, I just started doing it, a mini vlog. And the beginner says, come along with me for part of my day. I show you what I feel comfortable showing. You'll feel like you know everything about China K and about what's going on with her. But do you know? Do you understand what I mean? It's curated. And it's like, I mean, it's good because you still get to see my personality and I share a lot, but I'm very aware of what I share. Privacy to me and safety is at the top of my list. Now, um, I recently had a baby girl. Um, she's about to be one next month. Thank you. The world knows her as Baby Royal. They have never seen her. And because I chose, I would say we, chose not to show her on social media platform, not because I'm a public figure and you feel like you know me and you know a lot, means you're entitled to my life and entitled to certain things that I choose to keep private. If I'm gonna show her face, I'll do it when I feel like, but for me, there's no rush, it's no need. And people genuinely get upset and angry because they cannot see your child or because they don't know certain things. And that is so wrong, because if you have your, you know, a creator that you support, you just support them because at the end of the day, why is your profile private? You don't wanna show certain things. You understand what I mean? So privacy and safety is at the top of my list. However, I do share a lot and I do share enough for people to relate to me. For example, the other day, as you guys know, I bought apples at the stoplight at 1 a.m. I got a variety pack. There was a different kind of apple. He bit one of the apples and put it back in the bag and sold it. And he sold me the two bag of apples for $1,000. So I shared that with everyone. And that's relatable because a lot of people are like, you know, sometimes I buy fruits and somewhere and it's, it looks good on the outside. But when you open it, it's something completely different. So I do share content that's relatable to a lot of people. But I do take safety at the top of my list, especially, of course, you know, in Jamaica, you know, it's kind of small. And like you said, when we do share on social media and you share your kids and your family, but you do it in a way where it's safe. They don't know where the kids, go, you know, the school they go to, the neighborhood that you guys live in. There's a way to share so you can relate to your, to your audience without sharing too much because safety is a priority. And that's something that you guys should put at the top of your list. Like, don't post, like, you know, live posts at certain things and things like that. But I still do share to where you guys know enough. 
Right. That's amazing. That's amazing. Naro, you do a lot of talking in your content. And your content causes and sets. Oh, y'all laughing. I was trying to be funny. I was being for real. He does. And, style, 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 style. and the chat, chat, chat. And the content that you make causes conversation. It, your community is about conversation. It's provocative. It gets the people going. So when do you draw the line when you feel that conversations are getting too too negative or too transparent in a way where it might cause an unsafe environment within your community. How do you regulate that? Um, for me, working with two females, it's difficult because you'll have one female saying, oh, I'm, I'm up here today. I'm like, yo, we don't need to tell people this. <laughs> but, you know, apart from that, you know, I love, I love working with leaders. I, I love that female energy. And my thing has, has, has always been based on authenticity. I don't really do the couples channel thing. I not I guess about that's just that's just not me, but along the way I realize that you have to give people something. You have to give people increments of you, of your life, of your personality, so them so that them can latch on to and relate to. Me grew up a big wrestling fan. So when we get older, I'm realize say quote unquote fake. You know, I realize what it is that really make it popular and connect with people, and it's the connection that the performers them in the ring can, you know, establish with an audience. So, if you make people hate you, make them hate you. If you make people love you, make them love you. You know, but it's all about establishing a connection. You know, you have to make them react. You have to make them feel something from you, from what you're doing. Otherwise. You know, you go out there and you get no reaction, then that's the worst thing as a performer that you can experience. You're on stage, nobody reacting to you. Yeah, it's the worst thing. So for me, it has always been about, you know, achieving that balance where you, know, you still keep some things to yourself. You know, if you pre my Instagram page, like, it's pretty, you know. Not really let people into what going in my day, like, oh, I'm eating this breakfast today. And no, no, no. But, you know, but you have to give them something. So even with the advent of podcasting, you find that with that kind of format, you can let people know about your personality a bit more. You can let people in on who you are as an individual. And with that, you can, you know, more than be able to establish that community and build that base that is integral in surviving in this YouTube world. Like you need to establish, an, establish a connection so that you can, you know, garner community. For sure. And let's talk about feedback within community. How do you know when people are just chatting and they're just running their mouth, saying baseless things? And how do you decipher between that baseless negative feedback and feedback that you actually can grow from and incorporate into what you're doing? You know, doing what I do, I have to deal with a lot of trolls. You know, so you see people tag you to certain things and, you know, it's like I'm reaching out point where I can at night say, all right, the person is just a chat shit on Instagram. I can just, uh, you know, go off. And sometimes when you do respond to them and check them, then you see that the attitude changes. Oh, my boss, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I never mean it like that. And I'm like, all right. You know, so for me, we always, you know, try to develop a level of discernment. So I don't have to, you know, respond to every and everything, especially negative, because sometimes when you do, you give way to that negativity to, you know, kind of seep into you and kind of throw off your whole energy, you know. So sometimes it's about protecting your energy as well. Um, but, yeah, you have to know at least I have that level of discernment saying, this person is a troll, this person, you know, sometimes giving some criticism that you may not like. And the irony is, is that, Doing what I do, I critique artists. I critique, you know, a lot of people in the space. And I have to be able to take on the chin some of the things that people say about me, you know, and about the show. And, yeah, it's, you know, you're never too high, you're never too low. Right. Uh, that's the type of mentality I have, you know. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Alicia, do you incorporate feedback from your community? Um, so what I wanted to add to that was when you have self-awareness, so when I'm aware of what I'm putting out there and I'm aware of who I am, I would say when I first started, I'm new in Jamaica, um, I felt like a fish out of water in a sense. So it was like a lot of judgment and back then it would affect me, but now 
in, I'm 30 now, I'm like, I, I'm aware of who I am, right? So I know how to differ when it's hate or when it's actually like something to help me and something I can grow from. But like he, just to backpedal on what he said, um, you just have to kind of sometimes just not let that get to you, right? So the self-awareness, I can look myself in the mirror and I'm sure of who I am. So you may, you can't be everyone's cup of tea. So I think that also needs to be important, right? So I'm doing this, you're doing this. I'm sure we might have similar fan base and we have someone that just likes one of us here, right? And that is okay. So I had to learn that I cannot please everyone. So you might not like the fact that I'm wearing this dress, but I like it. So that for me, feedback, I'll take it, but I'm learning and growing and that's my journey. So if you like it, join. If you don't, then that's also fine. It's all love. So self-awareness is key and self-confidence when you're a content creator because backlash will come, right? So just be level-headed as well. For sure. Chani, when you receive feedback online, how do you navigate it? Do you accept it? Do you block it out? How do you know and how do you decide what is worth allowing to actually enter your mind? Um, I really don't pay attention to, to the negativity or to, you know, I really don't do anything for, for backlash, but I really don't pay attention to the negativity when it comes my way. Every now and then maybe I'll troll just for the fun of it. Like when I tell you, you know, you comment like, you know, why, why are you hiding your daughter? They'll be like, why is your profile private then? Why don't you post it? You know what I mean? So like I'll, I'll troll sometimes just for, you know, the giggles, but not, not in its entirety. Social media now, the platforms have made it very easy to control who's into your profile. There's blocking, there's restrictions, there's reporting. You know, so you, I could encourage you to take advantage of that, which sometimes I do. But for the most part, doing, you know, being on social media, you understand that you're putting yourself out there. And like Alicia said, like, you're not everybody cup of tea. I'm a mint kind of girl, she's a ginger kind of girl, and that's okay. You understand what I'm saying? A little bit of something for everyone out there. So if you don't like it, you move on. But for the most part, I just do what I have to do. And when your page, when your following is like your true followers, once somebody come around and says something negative, they'll do it for you. They'll respond for you. If they post you on the vlogs or whatever, and they say something negative, best believe your supporters got your back. So sometimes you don't even have to say anything or focus on that. And if I do feel overwhelmed, which mm, when it comes to social media, I really, I really don't feel overwhelmed to, to an extent. It's okay to take a break. It's okay to take a minute and just, you know, step back because life is lifing. So step back and then you come back whenever you feel comfortable. So if you're a creator and you get like negative backlash, just take a minute, go, go in real life for a second, and then you know you circle back on a platform, but it's very important to be strong and know that if this is what you want to do, going on the social media to create content and opening up yourself, just know somebody out there like ginger tea and you're a mint tea, and that's okay, you understand? It is, it is, and I wanna highlight something you said about the community controls. I love that you suggested that people, well, content creators, manage their community. Yeah. And Becca, do you manage your community at all? Because I remember you were talking about tone of voice between your business and it's different from you, Becca, the girl that overshares, she said. How do you apply controls to your business account? When you say controls, how do you mean? Do you have blocked words? Do you utilize blocking when people talk too much? Do you utilize any of the community controls for your business? No, I don't actually. I haven't, um, I haven't had to as of yet. And that's good, that's good. With, with Deadly, there's not really anything controversial in there. We're literally spotlighting artists. I'm, I'm barely in the content unless it's been requested that I'm in it. I put the artist first and that's what it's about. So um, there's no need for that. And on my page, I, I don't really, um, as of yet, <laughs> get too, obviously there's always going to be like a negative comment here and there, um, but for the most part, I, yeah, haven't needed to do that just yet. Um, but yeah, I was going to echo like what you said as well in terms of like being in the right headspace to have a look at certain things where you know there maybe isn't going to be a great <laughs> response. So I will like 
definitely not go there if I'm feeling a little bit, yeah. But there's other times when I find it quite funny. Like, I, um, I create content for Clark's Originals sometimes, so I make TikToks and they post it on their page. And because it's not my account, like, people will just go in. And sometimes when I need a laugh, I, I do just pop over there and have a look. Because Gen Z are very creative with their disses. <laughs> they, they definitely are the Someone most creative. Was like, Someone said, um, you look like a you look like a, a Black Panther who's decorating. I was like, what does that even mean? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, sometimes you can be in the right headspace for it, sometimes not. But yeah, so far I haven't used any um Okay, no, any that's of good. The, that's yeah. good you that you haven't. I have. You have? I definitely yeah, have talk to us about it, Alicia. I've blocked out certain like words, certain, so you cannot come on my page and comment, all of that. And I'm a block queen, I'll block you. Like, you're blocked. Get them out of there. <laughs> yeah, because they're there for that reason, you know, and you're restricted. Because sometimes you're just talking crazy. Like, how did you even make this up from this two-second video? So, and like Chinese said that your community will, because I would see them going back and forth. And sometimes their facts aren't that true. But, you know, like the other day, oh, it was anniversary. And someone commented, said, happy birthday. Someone said, no, anniversary. Oh, but her birthday was last week. No, her birthday is July. But really and truly, it's June, you know. So, <laughs> so it's that love as well that keeps you going that no matter, you might see that one comment, there's more love than the hate. So focus on the love and keep being you because your community loves you. And I love that. Get them out of there. Okay, <laughs> Alicia said, not today. We're gonna do this my way. You're not Lots. gonna play in my comments. <laughs> I love that, I love that. And we all here can agree that we're familiar with the term, read the room, right? So before you all came out, I read the room and I asked, who was tired of content? Does content drain you? And a lot of content creators and people that want to brand themselves on social media and on YouTube raise their hands. So I want you with our closing part of the conversation before we go into Q&A to speak to them. How do you continually find love and purpose and passion in the work that you do through social media? What keeps you going? Why do you not quit? Naro. Ladies and gents, you see that picture right there of me? Uh, I'm a fraud. I'm a big fraud. The shades that I wear is to hide the bags under my eyes because it's tiring doing this. And I do a lot other than hosting. I do a lot behind the scenes that people know about, right? So with that said, you know, I've recently discovered a tree that I speak to, I have conversations with. I just go and talk to the tree tell the tree about my problems, about my issues, and it relates right back to me without judgment, you know? So I found that connecting with nature has really helped me. You're not in like, you're taking this really seriously, and I like that because it is serious. I'm not playing. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, just to piggyback on, you know, the sentiment of the community and the love, like, I've, I've found that the love that I've received from the people helped me, you know, to keep going because... As much as you may look in the comment sections of our videos, and some of them is a cesspool, let me tell you that. But in person, out on the road, is nothing but love. Like 99.9% .9 love. When people approach you, love what you do. Keep doing what you do, bro. Like, what you're doing is needed. Like, them thing that keep me going personally. And to see that we're actually out here making an impact, you know, affecting people's lives globally, like them type of thing that give me the energy that I need to really push forward and you know keep this thing going. Even though I get discouraged from time to time, and I know my co-host can, you know, attest to this uh, and relate to this as well. Like a whole lot of things we've been through, but yeah, like them little thing that help me, you know, keep me up and keep pushing. You know, yeah, yeah love yeah. the people. Yeah, Chinese. The people say content gets on their nerves when they try to create it. How do you keep content off your nerves? Like I said from the very beginning, I do it for the love of it. And when you do it for the love of it, it doesn't seem like work. So I feel like now when people are like, oh, I want to be a content creator. Like, do you want to do it for the love of it? Because you see your favorite con content creator on the platforms and you feel like they're making money and they're going to, yeah, yeah, that's what I want to do. 
I started out doing it for the love of it. I didn't really know about YouTube analytics, like in depth. I was just posting because it was like, okay, that's where you post your video content. And I feel like once you do it for the love of it first, then everything else will fall into place. There are times when I would get discouraged in a sense where maybe like, you know, if I don't feel like posting or, or, or something like that, but I do post things that happen to me on a daily or things with me that's going on and people relate to it. I really don't have like a strict schedule with posting. Like, you know, I have to post Monday, I have to do this, I have to do that. I just do whatever content that I feel like funny. Sometimes I do like trends and everything like that. So I just keep going. And to jump off of what um, Naro said, sometimes, like even when I was doing the YouTube series, sometimes I'm like, oh, Jan, I'm do it again. But then the comments, the feedback, when people see you in person and they tell you how much I was down and your video made me happy and it made a difference and it brought you know me and my husband together, me and my girlfriend together and stuff like that makes you feel good and it makes you feel like, all right, well I guess I gotta you know continue and keep pushing. So the audience and your followers and your supporters that genuinely support you and they rock with you and they want to see you do well, no bad minding. They just want to see you do your thing because you don't even know, like you might think you post something so stupid and simple, but it brought laughter to somebody that needed it that day. Them seeing a post from you really cheered them up. So it's, it's important to always keep that in mind. And when we get discouraged here and when you guys, if you're content creators get discouraged, just think about your supporters. If necessary, go back and read a couple good comments. You know what I mean? Take your break, like I said, because that's still very important. Forget the analytics and the fact that you got to post Monday at five o'clock. Take a minute. It's important. Find a tree. You understand what I'm saying? Find a tree. Touch grass. Talk to the fridge. Some Do something. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then circle back and be the best you that you can and post your content. Amazing, amazing. If you raised your hand earlier, just nod if you're feeling a little bit better about it. See, you're impacting lives. Thank you so much. Becca, have you ever felt burnt out? You run multiple accounts. So that's a lot of content coming out of you. Business and then also self-representation and information share. So if you've ever been burnt out by that, talk to us about what you did personally to get over it and to get back on the horse and keep that content flowing. Yeah, I get burnt out. Um, I think the important thing is putting mental health first so I'm not afraid to delete Instagram from my phone and come off of it for a whole month I don't know if that's the thing you're supposed to do but um I can say that that helps me massively like maybe I'll still be that'll be like my personal account I'll still be you know working on the deadly account but I have someone to help me with that but um but deleting it from my phone and just using that time to clear my head is super important it means you may have to work a bit harder when you come back on because it kind of f's up the algorithm but that for me is the is the more important thing um and then in terms of like also pushing through it's it's i guess again echoing what you guys are saying about focusing in on what is the intention here and for me the intention is to push the music as far and wide as i can to give um, artists, a platform to get this content seen by as many people as possible. And until I've done that, I ain't going to stop. So I just, that's what keeps pushing me because I love to do it and it's fun. And yeah, like the mission is so clear in my head. So when I do get burnt out and I'm feeling sorry for myself, I'm like, cool, I'm going to take a break and then we're going to pick it back up because we're, yeah, we're very much on a music mission here and it's going to, it's going to get done. So it's, it, I find it kind of easy to push through when I, when I zoom out and look at it from that lens. The common theme to this topic is this mind frame. Mindset is very, very important. That's what I'm picking up. I'm just pulling. Mindset. Doing what you have to do to go back to you, like you said, Alicia. And you, in your household alone, you wear a lot of hats. You're a mom, you're a wife, you're a confidant, you know, and that's just three small things. So the balancing act mm -hmm. that is your life, obviously, how do you continually pour into yourself to allow yourself to continue to create content at the same time? Um, I allow myself to be present 
when I am by myself. So even if it's in the morning, if I just need, after I've dealt with everyone, even if I need 20 minutes to just lock myself in the bathroom and shower just running and I'm not in there, just to hear the sounds of the water, to calm myself, I'll do that. I journal. Prayer is key as well, just to reconnect, pray, you know, find your purpose back again. Um, I Speaking of burnt out, I felt that last year, because we were doing vlogging, then kids, you have the household to run. I have people, little people to keep alive, you know. So we shot about like 32 episodes in one season of our podcast. And I was like, I am tired and life was lifing, right? So it's okay to take a break. That mental health, that self-care is important, but also... When I would be on the road and you would hear those positivity, like I watch your podcast, you know, really inspired me. That keeps you going. And as well as when you hear that when you're going through something, it lights something up, right? So I think it's very important, self-care. So even if every week, once a week, meditate or journal, pray, you know, you need that. Yes, you really, really, you need that. Or I even listen to like, some like positive affirmations, you know, like you wake up in the morning, look yourself in the mirror and do that just to keep yourself going because guess what? The road in life isn't easy. We're going to keep feeling burnt out and we need to learn how to keep pivoting through that and being honest and vulnerable about that. Sometimes life is lifing and I just need two seconds to just breathe, right? And deep breathe also, like or talk to a tree, you know, whichever. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much. Give some gratitude to our panel. Naro, Chani, Becca, and Alicia. All of you shared so thoroughly and so transparently. Thank you so much. And speaking of mind frame, we got our minds right for some questions. All right, all right. My good brother Ahmed should have the mic. Does anyone have the mic out here? Oh, we have the mic here. So we can meet her. All right. Hi. Ch -ch -ch All right, cool. Um, hi, morning panelists, morning hello. everybody. Um, my name is Joe Davis. I am a musician and artist type thing. Um, I essentially, this is a, br it's a very niche question, but I feel like it still would give value to people who it doesn't necessarily relate to, but it's kind of more specifically for Becca. So. I myself own a company and co-founded a company called the Garden JA, which is basically a online platform and we've just started branching out into live entertainment, but it's a platform for up and coming Jamaican musicians to showcase their talent, which is literally exactly what yours is. And so I kind of wanted to just hear a bit more about the background of that and like the steps that you took to grow it to what it is today because the whole like managing two accounts thing with my music account doing my own personal stuff and then with the garden account and all that kind of stuff. So any insights that you have on that, I feel would be helpful for me and for anybody else who's trying to do the same thing. His mm. mind is right. He <laughs> asked a very actionable question that I'm sure when you answer, I'm going to learn. Let me hear the accent in here. Yeah, that's a great, what are you chatting about over there? Yeah, we're chatting, you know he's chatting. under your breath. <laughs> Okay, okay. Um, yeah, thank you for your question. Nice to meet you. And that sounds sick, what you're doing. I'm definitely going to check it out. What's it called again for everyone? The Garden JA. The Garden JA. Okay, sick. Um, so, I guess I had a bit of a foot in the door already um, because I had already started to build up my own platform as like Becca Dudley, presenter, DJ, etc. So I think that definitely gave me a leg up when it came to uh, getting artists. So I started off with bigger artists and then brought in the newer artists. So there it was um, 2017, I think, and Chronix came to the UK, <laughs> uh, and Christopher Martin and Jesse Royal, they all came in one summer. And I had already had a link with Chronix, so that was the first video that we put out. And it's still the most successful one to this day. Um, he did a cover of Natty Dread for Mali, and it's like sensational. But yeah, and I think that is kind of a little bit of a cheap way to then get <laughs> more artists when you're starting off at that level. Um, and that's, that's kind of how I personally attacked it. It was like, cool, well, we'll go in with the big artists that will start bringing up like a... Uh, a following that will get some attraction 
and then once we've got a certain amount of people, then we, you know, we start bringing in the, the newer artists. And that's what we do every year. There's definitely a balance between established, well-known names and also, you know, people who have maybe just a couple of thousand followers or even hundreds. So um, in terms of the getting of artists, that's how that's run. And to be honest, like the, the biggest takeaway I could give you is like play the long game. The long game, man. Like it's not gonna be a quick overnight, especially if, if I don't know what kind of um, musicians you're, is it just Jamaican artists? Yeah, so in the grand scheme of the world, it's quite niche. And I, I know that, like, when I'm, I keep that in mind all the time when I'm like, oh, it's not building as fast as I want it to build. Like, it, Deadly is not where I want it to be. We're very much still at the beginning. Um, and I see, like, big things for the brand and, you know, growing into much more than just a video platform as well. So, like, I have big plans for it. So patience is like super important with this because um, it's not necessarily something that is going to just blow up overnight. Consistency and the long game. So just put, making sure that you're posting something every week is kind of the um, one of the most important things for me. So we come to Jamaica and we shoot as much content as we possibly can so that we have enough content for the entire year to drop a video every week for the whole year so that you know on a Sunday, you're going to get a fresh new Deadly session. So, yeah, you want to become a place that people can rely on and you know they know where to go for your content. They know where to go for live sessions every Sunday, every Wednesday, whatever day it is. It's like having being that, that platform that people can trust. So, yeah, consistency, long game. And I don't know if you have any ins with any other artists, but, again, it's like... I'm sure you do in <laughs> Jamaica, yeah. A lot of it is connections and who you know, so it's like really drawing on on um, on that and, you know, doing favours for people. That's, yeah, that's how we got some of the artists that we got, you know? It's just networking, long game, yeah. And Thank you'll get you, there. If you love it, you'll, you'll get there, for sure. Next question, please. Hi, my name is uh, Byron. I do have a question for Chiny as well as Alicia. Um, Chiny, you said when you um, started, you got robbed and uh, you had some challenges initially, but um, you know you kind of overcome. Can you just elaborate in terms of the drive on that, and then what's next for um, China and for Alicia? Um, were there like a tipping point when you look at Asaf and say? We can do this. And then that drive and you just start being successful because what I realize is that um, you guys are successful is just not accidental. You guys are just dominating. So if you're able to do that, elaborate on that, that would be good. All right, so at the time, like I was saying in the beginning, thanks for your question, by the way, I was working at an ice cream shop, right? So I was taking all my little money and pouring it into, I know I wanted to do something. And I know at the time, my mom was like, Carrie, you need to save your money, save your money. But I was like, save money? I'm young, I'm jiving, I'm making, I'm getting a paycheck every week. I remember a hurricane came, Hurricane Sandy. And a whole lot of, and Jer Jersey's not prone to hurricanes. It's one of those, you know, free things. And the whole of the ice cream shop flooded out. I'm talking the buckets of ice cream bobbing like this. So I went to work the next day, dressed and everything. Boss man said, they ain't no work. And I was like, I wonder if this is the rainy day mom been talking about. And I ain't saved no money. You understand what I'm saying? And I had to go on unemployment. I'm like, unemployment? And you know, they pay you less than what you were making a week time anyway. So I went from that to, all right, now I need for really, listen, because the rainy day do come. I thought she was lying, but the rainy day does come. Right? So from then, Imagine you having that little bit of money and you're putting it into a business called Jolie Fair. And I was taking French in college at the time, so the name is French. And I was just getting robbed because at the time I was selling hair extensions um, and I was getting it from China, but I didn't have the money to buy the stock. So what had happened was when you place an order, like, you know, set of ear costs like $5, I would charge 10. So I would get the 10 and then when you order, it came so quickly, I could tell boss man in China and the hair comes. But then when you order, 
and you get the hair, and I'm doing, because I'm looking at all these people online doing it. I wanted to do a business, so I'm doing my research, I'm mimicking, I'm up at night, and it just excites my entire soul. Like, the passion that I have in the business and the creating, and I would stay up because you're doing business with that side of the world. So when it's time for you to sleep, they're up, so you have to be up talking to the suppliers in China, in India, Asia, wherever you're going. And I would watch and I would get like the pretty box. I would put like a token, but I didn't understand that it took, whoever I was mirroring, it took a while for, the, for them to get to that place. So I was spending too much doing what I needed to do. So when you get your hair now and you sew it in, I say, no, I just look nice. All right, cool. I'm gonna tell the bank that it was a false charge. So when they did that, I'm like, yeah, I'm getting orders for $500, $300. And then when I get the charge back, because you're using Grandma Sally's card over there, when she realized this charge, they take that money back from me. So I was out of product and I was out of money. So it was getting too much for me, so I stopped. Then I started selling, remember 50 Shades of Grey was big at the time. I found a supplier in China and I was selling 50 Shades of Grey necklace and bracelets. And it took off. And nobody was robbing me or anything like that. Twenty, twenty-five dollars I was selling it for. It took off. It took off to the point where the author, Miss E. L. James, had her lawyer <laughs> sent me a letter to cease and desist. Because you sell an unofficial um, you know, jewelry from her book. So I was like, oh, all right. All right, sis. Like I ended up having to stop, heard but I was you, you know, heard you. <laughs> yeah, we you I heard you loud and clear. But I was still making my little money. But then now, I, back to the On My Mind series, I, did, I launched season four from India. And I went to India and I was like, wow, the hair in India, man, like the baby just born and the hair is like, and I was like, okay, I want that. I want that too. And it, moving to California, I'm going to school. I realized there was a lot of natural hair girlies in California. And my sister was going natural. So, you know, I follow fashion. So I was like, I'm gonna go natural too. But at the time, Black people were spending so much on, you know, hair extensions and, you know, to cream our hair and all that. From I bought, my mom's been creaming my hair. I didn't even know I had curly hair. I mean, it's straightened now because, you know, I had to give you all a different look today. But, you all know, it's curly and ting. Like, I, you're like, thanks. But I didn't even know I had, like, nice hair. So then I invested in that, figured out what makes these people, why are they hair like? Of course, yes, it's genetics, yes. However, there's certain elements and herbs and things that they use that could apply to everyone. So I went over there and shot season four of the On My Mind series from India, worked with someone in the village with the oil and everything. And then I was like, okay, this is what we're going to do for all my natural hair girlies. And it was a movement when you saw all the girls were going natural. So I'm like, all right, let's revisit Jolie Fair. So I revisited Jolie Fair. I put on the hair extensions. I didn't want to get sued for the, the Fifty Shades of Grey bracelet. And through Jolie Fair, I started selling the organic hair growth, hair nourishing oil. And I offer it online for the US customers in Canada and UK and also in Jamaica in the stores. Now, when I had it here, I used to meet people at Burger King in Halfway Tree to want about it. I didn't think that Jamaicans would want it. And I would meet one or two people at Burger King, but then it got to a point where so many people wanted it. And for safety reasons, people just buy one, just, oh, I'm just buy one so I can meet you in person. You know, you might, you don't, that's not safe at the end of the day because I am, you know, popular. And so it got to the point where now it's distributed island-wide to where you can get it. So it's like, yes, yeah, Sally robbed me back in the day of my three, $500, but I never gave up and I never quit. And I think that's important. If you have like a, a business idea or something that you want to work on, it's okay to step back if it's not making you money or, you know, maybe you feel like the calculations are off or something. Just ease back. Think of something else that is in need in the market. Think of something else that you can offer, a product or a service, and then circle back, which is exactly what I did. And now it is a successful business. And side notes, instead of like doing a negativity on social media, figure a way to use it for a business or a service. It makes it so, so easy now to reach the audience that you couldn't reach back then. It's called a World Wide Web for a reason. Use it. Don't talk crap about people. Use it to leverage your products, your service, your music. And, you know, it can be, it can be good if you focus on that side. I thank you. Amen. Amen. Amen to that. 
Um, how do Asafa and I motivate each other to keep going? Was that the question? Um, I think for us personally, our community keeps us going. And also, we don't have to put on a show. We are being ourselves, so it's not like we sit there and we're like, so who are we gonna be today? What are we gonna pretend to do today? It's really, you pick up the camera, you pick up your phone, this is us, this is what we're doing. So we're just, I guess we motivate each other because we're being ourselves. And our community appreciates us being ourselves. Sometimes, you know, my husband is sometimes a little bit raw, unfiltered, he might trigger some people, but... <laughs> You're going to stick they, beside him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my man. We're going to stick beside him. But um, I think it's, it's just the fact that we're being each other. So I would say if you want to get into content creating, just be you. Be who you are. You cannot be anyone else. And nobody else can be you. So just keep showing up. It's not easy, yes. But who loves you will love you. you again, I think the takeaway for me from this, if you learn anything from me, you cannot be everyone's cup of tea, so don't try to be. And with that, you'll feel motivated every day from the love from your community because you might think it's something small, but they're very inspired by the fact that you even just got up today and worked out, right? So make sure you're being you to the fullest every day. Even if you can only give 10%, give them that. Amazing, amazing. We have time for one more question. Greetings. Afternoon, everybody. Um, great panel. So uh, my name is Yared. I wanted to ask a more technical question about, you know, because we spoke about feeling burnt out making content. So um, I wanted to ask you guys advice about, like, dovetailing or how to, you know, efficiently plan and edit the content so you can get the most out of it. You know, for example, the fix is a long-form thing, but they also have the quick fix or... You know, Deadly has, you know, little short, short clips and stuff like that. So how can, what advice can you give about, you know, being efficient in the editing and the planning of the content to extract the most value out of it so that you can avoid burning out and having to feel like you're constantly on the wheel, you know? So, or like Becca spoke about filming 15 videos in a short amount of time so that she can schedule the content out. And if there's any specific tools or platforms that you can recommend. That's a good question, and we were on the same page because I was going to say, Becca, you did talk about content planning. So can you just give us a bit of a, the short version, but a deep dive into how you plan your content and how you set yourself up for success for the month? Okay. Well, I remember um, there's an app that I use that is has changed my little ADHD life. Tell us Let what it is. Tell you. It's called Groove. It's a co-working app. So if you um, run your own business or if you're a creative, it's ideal for people who work from home a lot, but even still people in the office use it. Um, and it's basically, you jump on, you jump on, you start a groove, and up to three people from around the world will join you, and you're on video to each other for just a few minutes, everyone's saying what you're gonna do for the next hour. So it's like, you're holding yourself accountable, you're saying out loud what you're gonna do, and then it goes into like a timer mode, and then it counts down 50 minutes, and then in that 50 minutes, you have focused time, and you know that you're co-working alongside other people, and you all come back on and regroup and you say how you got on. Sometimes you're like, ah, oh, I got completely distracted and I didn't get as much done, I'm gonna go again. Sometimes it's like, yeah, cool, I ticked all these things off. And so that has been a game changer for me. I use it pretty much every day. And there's like a growing amount of Jamaicans on there as well because I've been bringing people in. So it's like a nice little community. Um, so I actually use that app as well to schedule the week. So I'll maybe jump on Groove and I'll be like, okay, so I'm going to work out this Groove. I'm going to work out like what is the deadly schedule for the next few months and then I'll sit and I'll do that. So I'll like compartmentalize each thing that I've got to do. I feel like your specific question was like, you were saying how, how, do, you, uh, uh, how do you drop the content without getting burnt out, right? Yeah, it's like just doing it in bulk, I guess is probably the best way. I don't know how you guys do it, Naro, but like, yeah, spending, setting out some time to like, schedule everything ahead of time so that you're not like each day on drop day 
trying to get everything together. Is the same thing with you? Yeah, you schedule it in advance. As far, how far in advance do you schedule yours? Out of interest. So, like, if we're shooting a podcast, maybe in a week we'll try and bang out like ten episodes, and another week just so we can. Even if in two weeks we could shoot the whole entire season, then we know that's done because we still have vlogging to do. You still then have to stay relevant on IG, TikTok. So you just have to pick and prioritize. Get this done. Then you have your um, Instagram, and Instagram is great because now you can kind of schedule when what post. So doing everything in bulk really helps. And I think social media, all of these apps now are trying to find ways to make that easier for content creators. So take advantage of it. And they always have these um, groups where you can join as well, and they kind of like because we all we all are going through it, right? To help each other maneuver through it. So shooting things in bulk for sure. So then if it's a week, you can get a week to yourself while. You're on this app, that app, but you're still relevant, so. Yeah, um, for me, it's drugs. <laughs> Pharmaceutical drugs, like vitamins, yeah, them thing there. Like, With all this gray hair you got, I would think <laughs> you would be uh, way more on. serious than you are. There's kids in the audience. <laughs> but, but in all seriousness, like, doing this for 10 years, like, me currently kind of go through some burnout um, because... There's a lot that I do, um, but for me, we kind of have things on on, on clock right now, and throughout the years, we've been able to basically figure out a process in which, you know, we can post consistently each week, you know, damn near um, every day. Um, for the most part, we shoot two days a week, and for the two days, we shoot like four pieces of content, or if we shoot on one day, it's so a podcast, you know, so uh, we can extract about four different clips from this one podcast and post it on the following days, you know, so things like that. You know, just after those, you know, know what you can manage as an individual, you know, if you can operate off a three hours sleep, then okay, I would recommend it. But if you can, cool. But for me, I've had to, you know, tailor and kind of, you know, so I thought my sleeping schedule because I was operating like four hours of sleep and I would get further burned out the following day. And for me, I really had to sort out my sleep, sleeping schedule, you know, get my life in order and get certain things done. So I know that I'm a night owl and I tend to get um, a lot of things done the night. So, you know, with me, this being, this being my primary job, if I'm working in the night, okay, then you need to sleep another day. Make sure saying I have nothing else to do on the day, the next day. You know, things like that. Or just try to go to bed earlier. Try to get more things done in the day so that you can have more time to sleep at night time. But every individual different still, so it's just up to you for, you know, know where you can hang where you can manage. Yeah. Can I just, I just wanted to, I wanted to add to, um, to what everybody say. I think it's also what you should know. I don't know if you're just starting out, but even if you're not, it's important to know going to your analytics and check. And I know especially with YouTube, once you start posting your content, you will know when your followers are active, what's the best time to post, what's the best day to post. And you could check this from on all your platforms after you know you've been posting for a minute and that could kind of help you with your schedule and your timing and know exactly when to post what and you might find out like okay like Thursdays and you know Tuesdays are my best days then you shoot your content knowing like okay I only have to post these two days because it's my most popular days. You post your long form contents on your Tuesday and Thursdays at whatever time that the, the platform tells you is a great time and that's your long form content. In between other days, the platform will also give you the analytics of the highs and lows of that specific video. So from that specific video, you edit the one minute, 30 seconds, the 15 seconds, and you post that as a YouTube short. You go ahead, you post it as a Reels on, on Instagram, or you post that as a TikTok. You know, so it's different ways in addition to what everybody say up there. You need to know your analytics to help you from you know, being burnt out, and also so you get to know your audience, know your pattern. Maybe you're posting at 5 p.m., but you're not getting any audience, but when you post at 7, that's a little bit better. And also use your head and think, what are most people doing at 5 p.m.? We, we, we're trying to go home from work. 
we at the bus stop, we're driving, we're in traffic, that might not be a good time to post content. So once you know the analytics behind the scenes of whatever it is that you want to post out there, it'll help you in addition to what everybody else said on the panel and you'll be on a great path. And there's several tools for that as well. Yes, as your resident YouTube representative, I will say I approve that message, 100%. We tell our artists that we work with everything China just said, our content creators we work with everything she just said. Reading your analytics really will help you not only with your content, but it'll help you make the best decisions for your content so that you're shooting your best shot and it's not just in the dark. And then after you measure that, you can figure out what works, you'll find out what didn't, and you'll understand which way you need to pivot based on that. So thank you for sharing. You did that, girl. You said that. Damn. Things were said, points were made. Thank you so much for your time and attention today. Gratitude for our panel, our esteemed winning content creators here. Much, much, much love and light to everything that you're doing. And again, thank you so much for sharing so transparently and informatively. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank y'all. Make y'all make some noise for our amazing panelists. What a phenomenal conversation, yeah? We are appreciative, again, of your time, of your energy, of your gift, of your genius. Go ahead, get that picture. And Ladies and gentlemen, don't go anywhere. We're going right into another conversation right now. Um, in the meantime, remember, as a matter of fact, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Can I get a, a, a DJ stop? Everybody chill. Where y'all think y'all going? You got to go to the bathroom? Hold it. No, I'm joking. Um, one quick thing. Before you go, even I, I, I just checked the uh, RSVP numbers on my survey. Remember I gave you that whole speech about my survey, how it's really important, and you all looked at me and you promised you said you were going to do it so that we can keep doing stuff like this again and again. I just checked my numbers. Guess how many people did it? 27 people. Somebody in here lying. As soon as they finish this beautiful picture, please, please, please make sure that you are pulling out your phone, that you are scanning the QR code, that you are doing the survey. Again, if you do not do that, we will not come back. We cannot come back. We can't do things like this. Yeah. If you, I know you do it too because you'll get a, a RSVP uh, email that says that you did or didn't. Of the 27 of you that did do it, thank you. Of the 150 of you that didn't, we got real problems. We're going to, I guess we're going to do a quick break. Yeah. All right. Please make sure I should see at least 150 phones out. Y'all stop lying to me. Come on. Let's do the survey, please, so we can continue to do this important work. As you take a break, make sure you meet somebody new. We're going to go right into our next conversation as soon as possible. What's your name, brother? Pierce. Pierce. Pierce, what's the biggest thing you just learned from this conversation? Um, yo. You need to fill out this QR code. 